I really believe that what we are ultimately doing is teaching people how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 518, with today's guest, Emily Kwok. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything that we're doing here is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about all of our projects and our products. It's where you'll find our store, and if you make a purchase in the store, use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off. Martial Arts Radio gets its very own website, and that is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. You know, we do two new episodes of this show every single week. And the entire purpose, the whole reason we're doing this, is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase. You could share this episode. You could follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about us. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave a review somewhere. We don't ask for those too often, and honestly, we don't get them very often. I would love to see more reviews coming. Or you could support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. Patreon is a place where we post exclusive content, stuff you're not going to find anywhere else, and you get access to it for as little as $2 a month. And the more you contribute, the more we give you. I had a great conversation with today's guest. We talked about everything from school culture to women in martial arts, the role of an instructor. It's a wonderful conversation, one I really enjoyed. And without trying to do it more injustice by summarizing it, I'm just going to let you listen. Hello, hello. <laughs> How are you doing today? <laughs> it's hot here. Yeah. It's hot. I know you're, you're, over, you're over the border, but where are you? I am in New Jersey. Okay. Why did I think you were in Canada? Because uh, I'm Canadian. But... Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not completely missing the mark. <laughs> where are you? I'm in Vermont. Oh, well, that's almost like Canada. <laughs> which, is, which is why I... Which is why I asked, because from what I understand, Canadians and Vermonters suffer from the same uh, lack of general awareness among the population for what is there and where things are. I've actually had people on support calls tell me, oh, Vermont, what state is that in? <laughs> well, I, I was in Vermont, let's see. My husband and I got married in 2008 and we went there, I think for our first anniversary. So maybe like 2009 oh, or so. Where'd you go? We, we went to, God, where was it? It wasn't, we went during the fall mm -hmm. and we took our dog and we stayed at this place. It was, it was within driving distance of, um, of the Ben and Jerry's uh, ice cream place, but it I can't remember the name of the town. Well, you're talking my neck of the woods. I'm 15 minutes away. Okay, so we stayed at this place. I don't know if it's still there, called the Paw House Inn, because we could bring our dog and they and they. I've heard, they I've, I've heard the name. I've been in Vermont long enough. I've heard that name. <laughs> I don't know if it's still around, but yeah, I mean, if you yeah, it was you were at Ben and Jerry's. I'm going to drive by Ben and Jerry's later on my way to the gym. Oh, so jealous. Yeah, and <laughs> and I really, I, it was so funny when we went to Vermont. I just kept telling Jerry, I feel like I'm back in Canada. Like it, it felt very Canadian to me. I hope that's not offensive. It's <laughs> it's not. It's not. I I love Canada. You know, one of the funny things about being in Vermont, especially northern Vermont, is that Montreal is our closest big city. Oh, how far is it from here? Two and a half hours. Oh, that's not. Bad. I can get to Montreal faster than I can get to Boston. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I haven't it's, been to Montreal, but I've heard it's lovely. It's an amazing city. It it really it really is. Uh, for for us around here, it's definitely <laughs> worth the trip. I don't know if it's if it's worth it to you to come up from from Jersey. Oh, you know, yeah. Jersey's depending so, on where you are, eight ten hours to here. Well, it's I think from New Jersey you can get to uh, Montreal in about seven hours. Actually, I think it's it's closer to get to than like I have relatives in Toronto, so I sometimes drive up that way, or I've been oh, okay. But um, Montreal, right I think, on. is supposed to be closer. I haven't gone yet, but it's it's a plan to go um, because I'm from the West Coast, the, the better coast. Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> I see. I see how it is. <laughs> you know, the, the guest form that you filled out uh, where we ask you to confirm the date and the time, uh, the number of people who are, you know, from California or just, you know, general West Coast time who seem to refuse to fill that out. Because I think there's even a note that says, you know, we, we record you know, we're East Coast, you know, and they'll put down PST and it's like, 
Okay. I feel like that's a little passive aggressive, but, but okay, that's fine. I can, I can do math. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, thank you for being amenable to the time. I, of course. Uh, I had a last minute bump in my schedule. So. Hey, so no worries. I, I, I go on when, when Leslie tells me. Okay. She does all this and, and sometimes she'll check with me and, and, and I, I vaguely remember an email about you and, and yeah. Hey, okay. you know, uh, sometimes we get requests from people in Australia that want to record, you know, at, at a normal time, their time. And wow, I'm not getting out of bed to record. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a very small list of people I'm getting out of bed to record uh, that we haven't recorded with yet. And uh, um, I don't think any of them are from Australia. So, so no offense to to any anyone from Australia, but That's I like great. my sleep. All right. Yeah. So- this is yeah. exciting. So you guys, if, if from what I understand, you're not uh, strictly jujitsu, right? We're not. No, bit- no. The whole the whole thrust of what we do on this show is attempt to connect martial artists. I, I believe very strongly that regardless of where you are and what style you practice, we have more that binds us than divides us. Wow, I agree with you, and I think it's probably something that needs to be. Um, spoken about more because mm. you know just like in real life everybody's trying to figure out how to divide versus come together the moment you start drawing lines and cutting people up into groups that doesn't stop and you end up being in your own box yeah and i just think that that's really silly all right so that's so, why we're martial arts radio not karate radio taekwondo radio uh japanese martial arts radio no we're we're martial arts radio we've i've talked to people about just about everything i mean we've had there are a handful of arts that if you want to get really specific that we haven't talked to people from but we've had you know sumo practitioners on we've had wow. endo i mean we've got yeah we've gone pretty niche and, and that's hopefully going to continue and you know talk to people from all over the world it's been it's been a lot of fun i wish Down. i spoke other languages because then we could reach even more people yeah seriously all right well yeah i well, how, am how would you feel if we just kept rolling? If I mean the recording's going, you know, okay. but how would you feel if we just kind of, you know, that beginning part stayed in? Yeah, that's okay. totally fine. cool. Listeners tend to like that, that kind of behind the scenes stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, obviously, you know, you mentioned BJJ. Yeah. So I think we know you're a BJJ practitioner. I don't do research, by the way. I, I know I know who you are, but I don't do research because okay. our listeners don't do research before they listen. So we just kind of jump jump right in with both feet. It's like that first day of training, right? You show up and, and they say, "All right, we're going to learn how to punch or roll or <laughs> or shrimp." I don't. What's what's the what's the first thing that happens in a BJJ class? What's the first thing that happens in a BJJ class? Well, I feel like there's a few different ways to answer this. I okay. mean, are we talk? Are you curious to know what my take is on what happens when you physically? step on the mats for your first class are you talking about yeah so i i've got i've got three months of bjj under uh-huh. my belt a, a whopping amount of experience just enough to to know i know nothing yeah and you know I've, I've grappled a bit you know i can i can hold my own unless someone has actually you know trained for more than three months but when we talk about you know the first day of class you know my mind goes to striking arts because that's what i know and so you know you think of that first class the first thing people usually learn is how to punch yeah. What's, what's the so, equivalent in, in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting about Jiu Jitsu is that um, it evolved out of Judo, you know, and uh, out of the Newaza, so the, the ground techniques. And um, for those of your listeners who are unfamiliar with, with Judo, it really focuses on getting from your feet down to the ground. And jujitsu is focused mainly on what you do on the ground. However, depending on the the school that you train under, in terms of lineage and um, where your your jujitsu is, you know, from, you could say, traditionally there has been an emphasis on learning self defense jujitsu, which starts on the feet, and this was popularized by the Gracies. So, if you have an instructor that falls under that line, perhaps you are going to be learning how to safely get from your feet to the ground or how to safely, um, you know, defend yourself or apprehend somebody from your feet before you go to the ground. And these movements can be a lot more um, structured and pattern-like. And 
they can there can sort of be a system that's put together. Now, if your instructor is focused more on a competitive or sport aspect of jujitsu, you might actually just get straight on the ground. And once you get straight on the ground, you could be learning sort of what what I would call the positional or the game like aspects of jujitsu. Um, some instructors might go ahead and teach you a submission. Um, and while I'm saying all of this, there are some people in the jujitsu umbrella that sort of believe wh whether you're doing self-defense or sport, it's all the same. Yes, it is all the same, but the manner in which a newcomer is introduced to jujitsu, um, I think can sometimes shape their experience and for some people make or break them immediately. Um, so in my school, we tend to do a little bit of a blend and my my ultimate goal with a newcomer in my class is to make them feel comfortable with being on the mats barefoot and getting to the ground. So we might teach you how to safely get to the ground or how to safely uh, get to the ground and get back up. Um, some basic movements that might involve grip breaking or uh, contact and putting all four limbs on the ground because, you know, I, I really believe that what we are ultimately doing is teaching people how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And as two-legged upright creatures, most of us don't spend a lot of time rolling around on the ground in any way. So for me, what's important is giving people a little bit of that language to teach them how to feel comfortable uh, being in sort of a foreign space, if you will. And from there, gradually uh, pushing what they can do and what, what they will learn so that they ha now have a fluency of, of working on the ground. Um, so that's what I would do in my school. Um, but I've seen all shades of good things and bad things and <laughs> things sure. in between that sure. occur. So yeah, that's my take on it. It sounds like you've spent some time thinking about that. It would this was just kind of a shot in the dark question. So I'm, I'm wondering, am I, am I reading that right? Is this something you consider, you know, that, that first day experience for your, your new students? Yeah. I mean, I really, I've been training jujitsu for about 20 years. I've dabbled in Sambo, um, Muay Thai, um, a little bit of MMA and boxing sprinkled in between. I largely came to jujitsu sort of without knowing what it was. Uh, I was, I was very blind to it. And when I started, I was really intrigued by it, but the learning conditions for someone like myself as a female 20 years ago were very unkind. You know, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is still, I would say a fairly new sport to, to be in North America. It's becoming more gentrified, but I wouldn't say it's as common as you hear the word like karate or taekwondo or even boxing if you're looking at combative sports. And my experience in it was initially as just a practitioner, somebody who loved training. And because I didn't have a lot of female training partners and people to work with, I started competing. And the, the competitive aspect for me was initially just to find others like myself and it turned into uh, an ambition to just be good at what I was doing. Um, as I wound down from my first round of competitive success, you could say that spanned over the course of a decade, uh, I wanted to have children and move on in different ways in my life. And I started to focus more on teaching. And I really, I, I've been... I've been clear with a lot of people to say, I, I believe from my personal experience and, and what I've done myself and what I've seen that there are different roles that we all serve in the community, whether you be a, a student of the arts. Uh, and I, and I think this goes for any discipline. It's not just to jujitsu, but whether you're a student of the art, uh, whether you're an athlete and competitor of the art, um, whether you're an instructor or a teacher, and then potentially another category of being a business owner. And in jujitsu, I think because it is a newer martial art that's being introduced to the masses here, um, you see a lot of, you know, influences, business practice, business practices, teaching practices. You see a lot of things being pulled in from other disciplines or other um, institutions, if you will. And we have the tendency because I think we are a younger sport than per se something like karate, um, where a high, like a, a very highly acclaimed athlete 
who's accomplished in performing jujitsu will then time out of their competitive career or feel like they need to do something else. And then they will just go open a school because this is sort of what everyone believes is the most natural thing to do. So they go and open a school only to find that maybe they're not able to build a successful school. They don't have a lot of students or they have a lot of people that quit or there's a lot of infighting or XXX. There's so many different variables of things that could work or not work. And I really boil this down to us recognizing all the different roles that one can play in their martial arts life. And um, to, to be clear about bringing yourself to the level of who it is that you're catering to and who it is that you're working with. So if I'm trying to be a, a, an instructor, that is a very different skill set from being a practitioner. Um, and when I am a business owner combined with an instructor and I am looking at the experience of a new student versus a competitor, I, I really try to sympathize and cater to their needs and bring myself to their level so that I can understand what they're going through so that they too can jump on board and enjoy what it is that we do and get themselves to a place where uh, they might be a competitor or they might become uh, an instructor down the line. But I give a lot of respect to the, to the fact that these are all very different roles, different skill sets. And I think we, I think we are more successful when we are conscious about who we are and who we're trying to engage with. Uh, and I think that is severely lacking in the discipline that I train in. Uh, I can't speak for all the other types of martial arts, but I, I would probably think that this is just a life case, you know, like the more, you know, about, um, the, the framework and the construct that you're operating within and how you fit into it. I, I think you can have a lot more success if you know who you are versus who you're speaking to and what you hope to achieve. And with that, you're touching on a subject that we've brought up a few times on this show, and that's the idea that the skill set to do and the skill set to teach are so dramatically different. And yet, in the martial arts, it is so rare that they are taught separately. Yes. Except when we look at really successful schools. When we talk to school owners who have you know, full-time programs and, and multiple students under them with part-time or even full-time positions or, or multiple schools, they all seem to have this development program where not only do higher ranked students learn martial arts, but they learn how to teach martial arts. Yes. Is that well, something you do in your gym? So I, I just like to think of it more as, you know, I don't think that a standardized system of teaching somebody how to become a teacher or a leader or X is the way that works most effectively for myself and my school. And so, you know, we've built what I would like to think of as more of a sustainable community um, at my school relative to business practices, which I think feeds into this conversation. Um, we don't have people who are sold on agreements and sort of pulled into things in a, in a very, uh, how shall I say, in a, in a way where they might not be certain of what they're getting themselves into. Mm. When students come to train at our school, I think a lot of them choose to come train at our school. They've, we, you know, we try to be transparent about the information that we give out. Uh, and so when they decide to come, they understand exactly, or they, they're kind of coming in eyes wide open, if you will. And, and we're very open and honest with that. And as that student chooses to become part of our community and um, works amongst us and, you know, befriends us, uh, if it's aligned with their personal path and, and what they would like to do, um, they might step up and say, you know, I would really be interested in helping the school out in some way, or I would love to learn how to teach. And uh, I work in consulting outside of jujitsu in sort of a peak performance space. Mm. So a lot of what we do is work with high performing individuals and help them uh, sort of find their, find their most optimal way of being so that they're not uh, obstructed in being able to perform in the most efficient ways or the most creative ways. And, and we find that that's very much an individual process. So one person coming to uh, 
coming to us and saying that they want to become an assistant instructor or, or an instructor one day might have very different uh, capabilities and challenges than another. So I tend to work with everybody one-on-one -on -one and we really look at sort of what they're hoping to uh, gain out of the experience and try to tailor that to their needs and uh, use their strengths in within our community. So I don't know if that was a very long-winded way of answering your question, but, but uh, we don't have a, a, a clean system, if you will, but rather more of a, I guess, like an individual mentorship, if, if that's something that somebody wants. And that makes sense. That makes sense. How do you get started? Let's, you know, now that we've, we've dug in, let's pull back out and, and rewind the tape. You said you've been uh, training for about 20 years. What was the impetus? So I was, uh, I was about 20 years old. I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'm from. And I had been very inspired watching some movies about fighting. And uh, one of them was not a very great film, but uh, inspiring nonetheless. And it was the, the film Ali that uh, Will Smith starred in uh, about the life of Muhammad Ali. And then the following year, another movie came out called Girl Fight. And it was about a young girl in Brooklyn who wanted to learn how to box, but it was kind of considered um, sort of inappropriate within her household for a, a young woman to learn how to box. And she manages to join a gym and fight boys and she does amazing. And it was a great feel good film. So I watched these two films. I got intrigued with this idea of boxing and I had been working out at a community center, um, you know, quite, quite regularly. I would say, you know, five, four or five days a week, I'd be in the gym two or three hours a day. And I didn't find that I was getting the, the gains that I, that I wanted in terms of my strength or in my appearance. Um, so I decided I would try something new and I looked up a boxing gym in the area and uh, through a good friend of mine, uh, or actually, I should say, through an old contact who later became a very good friend of mine, was sent to a boxing gym. And within two months of my boxing life, uh, I kept injuring my knee because it wasn't handling the, the torquing of, of you know, the angles very well. And I found that I was really uncoordinated. So uh, I dropped boxing because it just wasn't fitting my body very well. And uh, I, he encouraged me to come with him to a Russian Sambo class. And when I picked up Sambo, I was fascinated with it. And Sambo, for anyone that's listening that doesn't know what it is, is, is uh, similar to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in that it's a grappling sport, but there is a lot of emphasis placed on uh, leg attacks. And uh, I tried Sambo out for a month, but the instructor at the time and the student base, there was a, it was a very... Uh, patriarchal <laughs> in individual who wasn't really excited about me um, performing and sparring with his student base, which was a bunch of teenage boys. And so um, I found myself feeling really limited by the leadership in the class. And one of my peers was a Canadian uh, male who said, you know, you might enjoy training jujitsu it is really similar to Sambo, but you'll find that the culture is a bit different. So they'll allow you to train with everybody and spar. So I, I went with him to a jujitsu class and I never looked back. I was really, it was a very intriguing art to me. I'd never seen anything like it before. Um, and I was, there was one girl in the class at the time and I was really inspired watching her fight um, men. They were sparring. And, uh, I, I said, you know, I want to learn how to do that. So I, I started and then I gobbled up every opportunity in class, uh, there was around me so that I could learn as much as I could as quickly as I could. And, you know, this was 1999, 2000 in Vancouver, there wasn't a lot of jujitsu. I mean, there wasn't a lot of jujitsu in America, let alone in, um, a city, but a smaller city like Vancouver. Um, so that's how I got started. Oh, that's great. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about on the show really since the inception is this disparity, this gender disparity within the martial arts that there are so many more men. And obviously there are exceptions. And if I'm getting my timing right when this is going to come out, there, there's an episode that'll come out ahead of this where we talk about that gender gap and how we address that. Yeah. Do you have some thoughts on that? 
Oh gosh, that's a very large question. <laughs> well, we can narrow it down and you can feel free to narrow it down where we want. It, it's, you know, you, what you, what you pose is a scenario, this idea that in this first instance with Sambo, you were the only female in the class. And that not only wasn't a great environment, but it was actively not a great environment. The instructor wasn't so keen on it. And then when you found BJJ, there was one other woman, which felt, you know, just the way you described it, what I heard was that felt very welcoming. And yet what I also hear in that is there was only one other woman. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think that the, you know, and, and it actually drove the, f- the first few years of my career because um, I never started doing martial arts for the sake of competing or teaching or, you know, if you'd asked me 20 years ago that I would have world championship titles and a school, I would have laughed in your face because that certainly was not the intention. But I think what happened was that I was so so desperate to find other people like me, meaning females, um, to test myself against and to train with that I started competing and and I would find any opportunity or venue to meet more women. And that generally tended to be competitions because, um, you know, within your, your pool at your school, you would know the one or two ladies if there were any. Um, and you know, I would say that, in jujitsu, we don't have a lot of women that practice compared to men. It's grown a lot. You know, when I had first started competing at a high level, um, the, the divisions were very small. And so you were lucky if you had one or two fights with someone your size and your belt level. A lot of the times they would combine uh, divisions because there just wasn't enough representation. And jujitsu is a very hard art to learn because there is so much emphasis, not only placed on the theory, but in the practice. And really, I think that's where uh, most of us are drawn to it is that it is a, you must have a partner in order to practice jujitsu and in order to sharpen your skills and get any better at it, it's the live act of fighting. So you must grapple another person. There are no forms. There are no drills and exercises that will, uh, allow you to be a more competent fighter. Like you can do these things in your off time, but really in live time, you, that's when you want to sharpen your skill set. But the difficulty in that is that if you are generally always the smaller person and the weaker person, you get pounced on a lot and, and beat up and not a lot of women want to be in that situation not a lot of women are raised to roughhouse or believe that combat or fighting is acceptable in the first place. So to come to the mats and to open yourself up to combat, I think is a a high barrier of entry already. And then once you're there, if your initial experiences are very unpleasant and you get hurt, you don't really want to go back. Not to mention maybe the people, you know, when I started, hygiene was not a thing. So like maybe the men in your gym don't smell that good (laughs) and maybe they're, you know, a hundred pounds bigger than you. Um, maybe they're hitting on you, you know, there there's, it it can get very messy, um, for, for females. And so because of that, I think the terrain has been especially rocky, um, for women to get traction and build. We're now at a place in the sport where there are more female leaders and there are more um, athletes and instructors, still not on equal representation with men. And I, I really believe that a big part of women being quote unquote equalized in, in the space also has to do with good men backing us up. And, um, I think that we need more diversity in representation at the top. So, you know, like when, if, if you have 20 different instructors and every single one of them is a man it's very hard as a, as a man, I think sometimes to understand or to sympathize what it is to be a woman or to be that smaller, weaker individual. So they might tend to lead the class, not always, but they might tend to lead the class in ways that are most understandable and beneficial for them, for people like them. Um, I think if we want to see more growth for women, if we have opportunities where we too are now at the head of the room, we can sympathize with people that are more like us and therefore with more diverse rep- representation, create more room for other people to thrive and grow, not just more of the majority. I mean, I think this really 
works on a lot of levels, not just in jujitsu or martial arts. And, um, my, in my experience, you know, it hasn't been easy getting to a place where I've sort of carved out my own niche or, you know, my own market. And I have had resistance and I have had a lot of, um, instances where people didn't want me in the room or people didn't want to give me space to grow. And in those situations, I think what I've tended to do was just look the other way and decide that I will just go create space for myself. And hopefully people will decide to come join me on my side of the room. And eventually we will be uh, big enough in representation that they can't ignore us, you know? So, um, there, there isn't always a good or easy solution to getting ahead. But I think that those of us who are underrepresented, um, the few of us that manage to get to a place where we might have a platform um, can and should try and create a platform to just create more space for people like us. Every martial arts school has its own culture, and that culture is usually, if, if not intentionally, accidentally instilled by the owner or the leaders, you know, the people at the top, you sound like a really thoughtful person. And you talked about some of those challenges that women have when they join martial arts, these ideas that, you know, sometimes it's a boys club and sometimes they're getting hit on and and so on. Are there things you've consciously done within your school to make it more accommodating to women? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question in in how it's phrased because um, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there is, I think right now with women, quite a movement towards catering to women by offering women's only classes. And so, you know, you'll find in a lot of academies, you'll have, uh, either, you know, if there, if there is no female with enough experience, maybe the head instructor who's a male will offer a woman's only class so that the women population in his in in their school can get together and train together um or maybe you're fortunate enough to have an advanced female who's capable of teaching that class herself so there there is a big movement to have women safe sort of spaces uh women's led seminars which i do a lot or camps which i do a lot of um to gather females together from different areas and have the opportunity to train together um, in my school, I actually, even though I've had women's only classes in other places in my career, in my school now, I currently do not have a women's only class. And I, I'm i 50% owner of my school and I share that ownership with a male. And I'm sort of 50% the, the head instructor. Um I feel at this point, you know, and, and I've had some debates with people on this, um, where my level of inclusion is sort of being leading from the front, if you will. So I think that most people, when they show up and they want to participate and do something that they're not um, familiar with or, you know, have, have no clue what they're getting themselves into, they usually show up and I think look for somebody like them. So they go, if there's someone like me, maybe I'm more likely to try this because I don't think women really do this sort of thing, or I don't think people over the age of 50 do this sort of thing. So when you find likeness and representation, I think you're more likely to give it a try. And in my school, I feel that being half the owner, half the head instructor, and having the uh, student respect and following, if you will, for me, that creates reason enough alone, I feel, for other women to come in and say, oh, look, I, this is an appropriate space for me because there is a woman that's leading the culture of the school or there is a woman that's leading all the drills and men are listening to her. Um, I've heard from some other people that they think that that's maybe a little bit too forward thinking, that maybe you know we need to come from a place where we allow women to be closer together because it's still very intimidating. And that very may, may well be the case. I do, I'm not going to, um, I wouldn't, I, I won't push back on that. And for some schools and some spaces, I think it's, it's, it's the right call and it's the right thing to do to have female based classes 
so that they're catering strictly to the female population. But in my school, I sort of feel that I can set the standard by saying, um, I own and direct everything that goes on here. So you better believe it. I'm thinking about your interests as well. Yeah. And, and I'm just getting the vibe that, you know, this school is, is an extreme passion seems like such a cliche word to use, but I don't have anything better coming to mind. It, it, it really seems like, even though you, you alluded to work you do outside of the school, so clearly it's not your only source of income. This is something that you spend a lot of time, a lot of energy on. And I'm going to guess that everybody around you in that school, all your students can pick up on that because it's coming through here. Yeah, we have a very, um, I think we're really fortunate that we built a really um, incredible community at my school. Um, I really like to think my, my school is kind of like an ode to everything I never had, if you will. Mm. Um, you know, in 20 years of living in Vancouver, New York and Tokyo and having both positive and negative experiences being a part of other schools. Um, you know, I, I've taught in many schools. I have been a student in many schools and I recognize how important it is you know, it's kind of like the job that you go to every day, you know, that environment that you spend so many hours in, uh, shapes so much of who you are and the energy that you bring to your craft. And I started, when I started doing jujitsu, it was really fun and, and it was intriguing and, um, and it made me really feel alive. And I, I feel like so many of us train what we train because of those reasons and I've had some experiences in my martial arts career where I didn't feel that way. I was made through the culture of the school to feel otherwise, that it was a very oppressive place or that I couldn't have fun or that it wasn't for me and, you know, moments where I almost quit. And so because of that, when I opened up my school with my business partner 10 years ago, um, I think both of us really wanted to make sure that this space was kept free of that type of uh, negativity and that the culture wasn't going to be top down. Um, you know, and when I say top down, I mean that uh, in jujitsu, it, it's very common for the head instructor or the owner of the school to sort of almost be a cult of personality. And uh, I don't really think it's a very sustainable or always healthy way to structure <laughs> totally the culture. You know, yeah. um, and and it's I don't I, I it sounds like it you know happens in a lot of different disciplines, and uh, I I personally have seen things implode multiple times because of that, and I also you know from a business perspective I also think it's very hard to sustain a business that way because as human beings everyone is I would hope trying to constantly better themselves and evolve and improve upon their skill set. And sometimes the teacher needs to be a student, but when the teacher is always placed in the position of always having to be the teacher all the time, um, sometimes that takes us away from being a student and that playfulness and that curiosity that might actually teach something to, uh, you know, the, the greater community is, is lost. And I've seen and met a lot of instructors who've lost their passion for being the leader because they've had to only lead for so long. And in my school, I value the, the culture that we all bring and that we all create by learning to lead uh, amongst each other and to support each other in that journey. So at my school, what we do is there isn't a singular uh, figurehead, but rather we, I, I think I structure the culture in such a way where everyone is asked to contribute and lead. And we, we really do have a community of people that contribute to everybody's growth. And I, I, you know, outside of me being the head instructor and teaching a handful of classes, I make room to make sure that my um, students that want to be leaders as well are given the opportunities to lead. And then I reinforce that by also being a student in their class so that the, the rest of the population can see that I believe in their abilities and that I trust that they're going to do a great job. And I think from doing this sort of a thing, we bring a different kind of life to the, the school or the, the environment that we create. And I, you know, I think culture, cultivating that culture within someone's school is everything. And 
um, you know, through all of this, uh, all the closures that have happened as a result of the pandemic, like I feel that our school is in a very good place to survive because people uh, have aligned themselves with wanting to be here for that reason. I don't think that most of our students are there because it's just the place to train down the block. I have a lot of students that have chosen to come train with us because they want to be there for what we've cultivated and what they've helped create. So it's, uh, it's very important to me because I think that this is this is humanity. Like this is how we learn to be better people. And I, I want to be surrounded by good people, no matter what it is that I'm doing. Um, so I'm very, I'm very honored, honored to be able to have that space with, with the 250 students that share it with me. I want to go back and make sure I heard you correctly, because if I did, this is a big deal. You give your students opportunities to teach and you are not afraid to step in as a student in those classes. Did yeah, that correctly. Yeah, I think. Can we talk I, about that? Because that's that's massive. Yeah, it's something I, that so few instructors have. The uh, I'm I'm going to call it what it is: the self esteem to do that, yes. and the willingness to support the students, and the realization that your job. Well, I'm I'm, I'm I'd rather hear your words than my own, so I'll I'll shut up now. Yeah, talk about no. that, please. Yeah. Um. So I think. You know, it's funny how when we think about martial arts or combat, we think, you know, especially with what we see today in like the UFC, uh, it's very easy for us to artificially believe that strength is seen through prowess and defeat of another human being. Um, I really think that true strength and, and for those of us who train in a martial art um, is built internally and that strength is built through vul vulnerability and showing that you're always ready to receive and interpret and process and evolve. And um, there's nothing better, I think, than to teach that to your students, to teach that to your community, which is that uh, you are never above learning and you are never above learning from anyone, you know, uh, and, and that you're not perfect and that you're not, um, you don't know everything. You know, there are one of the unique things about jujitsu is I think it evolves so quickly and people can kind of take their own flavor or their own twist on their movements and uh, make it work for them and then teach it because maybe it'll work for others. Uh, it's not it's not restricted to a particular style. And I think, quite frankly, as an instructor, it would be virtually impossible for one person to become an expert in all of these different styles or variations of so that they could then control that information and teach it to their students. And so I am a big fan of sort of saying, I know what I'm good at. Uh, you have your interest area and you know what you're good, good at. And there's things that you know how to do that I don't know how to do. So what better way to demonstrate a positive culture for learning than for the instructors to participate in other people's classes, or rather, you know, more specifically, like the leadership of the school to say, I am going to participate in this person's class. So within our ranking systems, uh, in jiu-jitsu, you have a white belt, a blue belt, a purple belt, a brown belt, and a black belt, and various degrees uh, of the black belt. On average, it can take anyone, someone somewhere from six to 10 years to achieve the rank of black belt. Um, I have teaching for, for at our school mostly black belts, but we do also have some brown belts, and they're very good brown belts. So um, it's not unlikely to see me, instead of teaching the class, taking a class that is being led by one of our brown belts or other black belts, because they're teaching me something that I don't know. And, uh, and, I, and I'm also very thoughtful to question them on their technique, um, one, to to, to put them in a place of critical thinking and understanding what it is that they are actually doing. And also two, to show the students that once again, I don't know everything and it's important to have a dialogue and to feel that it's okay to question and that it's okay to be curious about things that you don't know. Because I think that so much of our culture, not just in martial arts, but just in, as humans in general, as we get older and we become better at doing things, there's sort of a false construct of being an expert and never having to question or look back on what it is that you're doing. Uh, I think it's one of the, the 
more negative aspects of, of what happens as we mature and we get older. Um, so, so I, what better way to challenge that than to break it apart and be the person doing it. Mm, couldn't agree more. <laughs> so many of us end up where you are now. And, and unfortunately, I don't think it's the majority, but it's still, it's a good chunk. And I would say that that group is growing this realization that as the head instructor or senior rank or whatever it is in a school, doesn't have to know everything that yeah. their responsibility is not to be a book of knowledge. It's really, it's, it's to guide. Yeah. And it's to be the one who fosters the, the growth of the others. How did you come to this? Did you come to this because it was modeled positively or negatively as you came up through? Um, so I think that most of my jujitsu, most of my martial arts career, I constantly looked for leadership. I made the mistake of feeling like my technical instructors were also guides or leaders in other aspects of my life. And um, for me, you know, jujitsu has not only been something that my body has been able to learn, but it's been something that my my mind and my soul has been able to be invested in and i feel like i've grown so much as a human being because of it and um much to what i was saying before about the different roles that we play um i i would mistake that my instructor my technical instructors were then also leaders when that usually was not the case and I found out much later in my career that it was a mistake in my own perception and my judgment that I was almost setting myself up for failure by believing to some degree that this technical instructor was um, in a, in a, on a pedestal or some sort of a, a, a deity or a God, if you will, that they would, you know, have some sort of uh, message secret, secret about life that they could tell me. When in reality, they were just humans that were very, very well versed at ex, uh, executing this particular art. And I learned this when I had a, a pretty disappointing performance at a tournament that I had traveled far away to. And when I had returned, um, I had felt like, you know, I had to go to the tournament by myself uh, due to some personal complications on my coach's end. And when I returned, uh, one of my very, very good friends who happens to work in uh, sort of the, the I, I guess you could say peak performance realm, sort of a psychological realm, had asked me what had happened, you know, when I competed and what, you know, where, where did I, where did I feel like I went, went wrong? And I was just so emotionally distraught over this idea that, you know, I tried to do everything right. I trained and I put everything into it. And there were some complications on my coach's end and they couldn't make it. Um, and I just felt a bit lost that I said, I don't know what I did wrong. Why why didn't they give me more guidance? Why had they not been there for me um, in more moments of need? They never called before I competed or after I competed to see how I did. And I just felt very, I, I hit quite a low point relative to, you know, I believed in this person that they were going to be there for me in my moment of need as I was going to go out and represent them. And then they weren't there. And uh, my friend said to me, it, he said, you know, this is kind of a, it might sound a little bit harsh, but, you know, you might need to look at who you are and think about the fact that you are a, an evolved person and you are a much better leader for yourself than the leader that you look to. You have to realize, and they had said, you know, I've done this plenty of times in my own career, that your teacher is a human who happens to be really good at doing this particular set of things, but that doesn't necessarily qualify them to be a life coach or to know what to do with themselves. And they certainly don't know what to do with you. So sometimes when we look at our coaches or the people that we look up to, that it might be better to look at them as tools in our toolbox versus looking at them as our entire toolbox. And I think that that really, um, 
struck struck me very deeply because after that I started thinking very differently about uh, leadership and and how I would not necessarily think that or leadership and and how I would think that I I can look within myself to find the things that I need and not necessarily rely unfairly rely on people for things that I'm looking for you know and um I think once I started doing that I started being able to see more success in my own performance and more happiness in my own practice because I didn't put these unfair pressures on people that probably weren't asking for them that's heavy stuff yeah <laughs> how do you, how do you feel now talking about how are you how you were feeling then and and what you had to do to get here how does that feel um, I, in retrospect clarifying you know i i went through a period i should mention like you know when i was doing that uh when i was in that reflective period i had just come out of a time where i had given up on myself and um you know, if you, if you would call it a rebirth, it was, it was constantly looking for external reasons to make myself feel better about my own practice. And in that moment, I was, I, you know, somebody had helped, helped me see through my thinking process. And, um, as a result, unveiled a different way of thinking about, uh, my career and and what I was and my decision-making process. And so, you know, before that, I had thought that I needed to see a sports psychologist or do something because I didn't feel that I was being very successful um, on the competition circuit, and I wasn't really as happy as I thought I would be. Um, and it's all a learning process, right? You know, like I, I, someone said, said regarding me um, once that I tend to always question how to do things better, and I think that that's probably true. Not to say that I'm not satisfied, but to say that, is there a way that I could do this better? Think about this better. How can I make this more efficient? Is this the, you know, is this process the best process? Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that that, that looking back, it's, it's very clarifying for me to have, to have had that conversation because I think it's, um, it's made me a much more, um, I, I feel like my, my, my self view is a lot more self-critical and complete because I'm not looking for external reasons for why things aren't happening. And I've been able to take more ownership of myself, my own, and my own decision-making patterns. And I think that's been a really positive thing. Um, I don't think we always view ourselves very clearly, you know, and in that same conversation, I remember saying to my friend that I just wish that I could perform for the team like I did in, you know, 2007 when I won the Worlds. I wish that I could go back to who I was then because that athlete would have been, you know, the type of athlete that deserved coaching or, you know, the one that the team rallied behind. Uh, cause I was still a fairly new athlete at this, uh, um, with this new coach and this new team. And he had said, you know, that is precisely what is wrong with your thinking. Even though you might've won in that year uh, that, and, and with that particular performance, you also have to acknowledge that that was in the past and everything, everything and every, every bit of who you are today is so much more than who you were back then. And you do yourself much better by focusing on the present moment and and understanding that you've grown so much and taking that and moving forward than trying to relate to somebody who was you um, earlier in life. So you're just you're um, you're a much more evolved person today than you were then. So um, so think forward and 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 live with presence versus compare yourself to some past version of yourself and. Um, you know, this individual, I think, has largely been so much of that leader or that sage or that guide that I was looking for. But this person was also not the head instructor of the school, you know. And so uh, learning to have these different types of individuals in my life that contributed to my overall success, you know, really came together then. And since then, I, 
I think I try to look at all the different people in my life and um, ask myself if they deserve the pressure that I'm always putting on them. And, uh, and, and I think that that moment was, was incredibly clarifying. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say about that. There's a lot there. We could, uh, we could have a Dr. Phil on the couch kind of session out of all that, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> but we're not going to do that. Sure. We're not going to do that. It's, it's funny. Sometimes we have, we have episodes that do really go, go in that direction. And, and, and I get some feedback sometimes people saying, maybe, maybe you need to have a, a, a separate podcast called Martial Arts Therapy. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, isn't that why so many people do it though? You know, we, we all yeah. are looking for a way to resolve our problems and what better way to resolve our, our, um, our psychological problems than to make physical, uh, combat. <laughs> right. Right. And, and I think that that's pretty important. I think that, you know, even, even simulated friendly quote unquote safe combat allows us to get into some, something pretty primal, something pretty innate to humanity that most of us don't get to express otherwise. I think well, it's you know, I, I do think that, um, what ends up happening really is that martial arts allow us to make physical sense of, you know, otherwise ethereal problems that are floating up in our head, you know, and we can't train out a lot of the problems that we have in our head, but if we make them real somehow, then, then maybe we, we can start flexing that muscle. And, uh, and I, and I think that that's why so many of us are drawn to it. And, and also the humility, uh, the, the fact that, martial arts being combative um, always brings you back down to your knees. So no matter how good you get at something, you always have to remember that you are human and that you are, you know, you are going to fail sometimes, but that you're going to have to get back up on your own and uh, figure it out. And, and I think that it's for that reason that so many of us who start martial arts um, usually fall in love with it. And in many in many ways, uh, change disciplines because we're constantly seeking more ways to feed, feed our souls, if you will. Um, so I think once a martial artist, you're kind of always a martial artist. I, I think it's, I think that's why they say, you know, mind, body, and soul. Mm, absolutely. Now, if we look out in the future, you know, let's, I'll, I'll even let you pick the time period, you know, it could be a year, it could be 50 years. doesn't matter to me. What are you hoping for? What are your goals? What are you working for? What's, what's coming? As a martial artist? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's at least loosely connect it to martial arts. It doesn't have to be strictly what would happen on the mats or in the school. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. I mean, you're talking the real long run. I, I mean, I think that I, I would hope for um, a, more, a more inclusive space so that everybody felt that it was welcoming or a place that they could belong in um, so that they could explore all of these dimensions of the self. You know, I think about trying to, on a, on a very micro level, um, create the kind of culture within my school, within my camps, within my brand, if you will, that would allow people to feel that there's always going to be space for them to explore this. And I would like to see the greater jujitsu community and, you know, bleed into MMA or other martial arts communities. I would love to see a time and a place where we didn't have negative leadership <laughs> and where, where people could um, really feel free to explore and practice being better versions of themselves. Um, that's a very ambitious goal. I mean, I, I can practice that on a small scale right now, but I think when I look at the long run, I would love to be able to contribute that type of influence to the greater culture. If, if that were my legacy, uh, if you, if, if, you know, that's, if that's what I would look at it as. Um, I, I think that so many of us in martial arts who are, given a platform to become leaders. I think there's a lot of people that don't learn how to be leaders and don't understand what to do with power and do the wrong things with their power. And as a result, I feel like sometimes the martial arts are not what they should be. Um, 
So I would love to see a time when we're a little bit more conscious and um, responsible for the people that we serve and the um, the growth that we we all hope to achieve from it, and uh, and and call ourselves out on it. You know, that's that's what I would like to see uh, just a healthier space for us to continue practicing. Great stuff. Great stuff. Now, what if people want to find you? If they want to maybe come visit, follow you on social media, check out the website, anything like that? Um, so I have a school in Princeton, New Jersey that people are welcome to check out. It's uh, www.princetonbjj.com. Uh, I am on Facebook, although, you know, I, I'm not I'm not always on social media doing jujitsu things. So I just keep a friends list that's far too uh, far too long. So just, you know, message me (laughs) and, uh, I'm on Instagram as Emily Kwok BJJ. Um, so people can reach me those, those three ways and, and keep up with whatever is, uh, is happening in my world. And you've done nothing but give great advice today, but I'm going to ask you for a little bit more. So what would you tell the people listening today? What, how, how would you send us out? What would I tell people listening today relative to why they should listen to this or why they're practicing? No, just some closing thoughts. You know, it's been a, it's been a great episode. It's been a wonderful conversation. And by conversation, I mean, you talked and I listened, which makes my job really easy. So just, uh, yeah. Yeah. How would you want to wrap this up? Um, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, it's, it's really open-ended, but it, you know, there, there have been a lot of thoughts floating through my mind. And I, I think that one of the themes that's been really prevalent for me that I wish was more prevalent for others is, and, and I think we, we need to do this as martial artists, but I think more importantly, we just need to do this as humans is something that we sort of open the conversation with is that I think we do a lot better in life if we learn f- to look at what we had more in common with people doing things of a diff- in a different discipline or a different way than if we continue to look for reasons to separate or create hierarchy amongst um, what we do. Um, I think tolerance and and perspective is something that we all need to practice more of. And we, I don't think we can grow as humans if we don't do these things. We've gotten into a place where we make a lot of rash and um, just instinctive decisions that might be serving the self very well, but they're not really serving each other very well. And by each other, I don't even mean like just your family nucleus, but it could extend beyond to your neighborhood or your town or your state or your country. And um, I wish that we all had a little bit more patience and tolerance to filter through the decisions and that, that we're making for ourselves and the way that we think about ourselves and, and how we fit into this world and to take a different perspective and sort of see how things might look from the other side and to not necessarily try to isolate everyone and, and sort of cordon them off and write them off because they don't agree with us, but rather think about what, empathize with what they might be thinking and feeling and see if there's a way that we can find some common ground so that we can actually make some progress. Um, I, I, that's something that I, I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, and I think that it relates so much to our practice as martial artists, right? Is Um, if we get too stuck in doing things a very particular way, it will work well for us to a certain point, but then at some point, everyone else will have figured out what it is that you're doing. And by changing your perspective, trying new things, um, learning new methods, you might actually learn to be a much better fighter and a much better training partner and a much better individual within your community. Um, so that's what I'd like to say. I had a great time with this one. And I think that that comes through. Hopefully you had as much fun listening to it. And I hope our guest had a good time as well. I I got the sense that she did. And so, ma'am, thanks for joining me. 
If you want to see everything from this show, photos and links and all that, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find that stuff for this and every single episode we've ever done. And if you're willing to support the work that we do here at Whistlekick, you could go to the store and make a purchase. Use the code PODCAST15 if you want to save 15% off. You could also share the episode, leave a review somewhere, Facebook, Google. Those are the two biggies. Apple Podcasts is another good one. You could tell a friend or you could contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. That's the place for that. And I hope if you see somebody wearing something with Whistlekick on it out in the world, you'll introduce yourself. If you have guest suggestions, let me know or other feedback. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.